Hello, this is Dr. Gutierrez. Today I'm going to be talking about the uh, neurons and I'm going to start talking about a little bit on how it relates to everything else. Now, there is a lot of, uh, there's actually a lot of great images on uh, anatomy and histology. I always recommend people use KenHub because I feel it has some of the best in images and most of my students seem to enjoy it. Now, what I am, I am going to show you an image here and what you will see is you'll see different aspects of the neuron and i will draw them out so they are a little bit more cartoonish for the lack of a better word so what you actually see here is you see the neur the basic neurons and these are some of the first images drawn of neurons and you have different types you have some that are coming together converging so it's convergence uh, you do have some that are splitting apart and activating other neurons aversion and you have bipolar multipolar and the big thing about this is you can actually see certain things. For instance, I'm actually going to draw it on the side here. You have a big round circle, which is the body, which is called the soma. Soma will mean body as you go into more of the anatomy stuff. If you talk about somatosensory or somatomotor, it's about the body. On the soma, you actually have these projections, which are called dendrites, which is usually where you receive the messages. So if you look at the cell here, you can see the soma and the dendrites coming off of it this one actually technically has a secondary axon but you'll see you can see what i'm talking about and then you have a long projection which is called the axon now this axon has this uh, neuron has everything that a normal cell would have it's just organized a little different the dendrites are cell extensions this cell will have a lot of mitochondria because it really this it requires a lot of energy the dendrites will have receptors the axon will have sodium potassium sodium and potassium channels which open up to allow sodium to come in and out and so there's a lot of action a lot of physiology that is re required to understand how a neuron works and there's a lot of great things that we can actually learn from it now i do want to stick with more with the aspects of the brain and so the big thing that I actually know is that the brain is, the central nervous system is the brain's spinal cord, and you do have white matter and gray matter, and it tends to be in different areas. Now, around the axons, you have a myelin sheath. A myelin sheath is made up of a fat called my, uh, sphingomyelin, and it myelinates most axons, mostly axons. And so where you have that, you tend to have more of a white matter. Where you have less myelin, you will end up having gray matter, has less, uh, has less myelin. And so sometimes you actually do have different amounts in different areas. Now, go back and remember in bones that cortex is the outer layer, medulla is the inner layer, or the middle. Now, remember, these are important words that you're going to see over and over again, so I usually recommend people write them down. Now... The central nervous system is divided into two parts. Now over here you can see the brain and the spinal cord, which is the central nervous system. And then you can see these nerves coming off, which are the peripheral nerves, which is everything else that's not at the brain or spinal cord will be peripheral. Now there is a basic embryology that happens with the uh, brain. And I did want to draw it out for you. Uh, usually what happens is you start out with three cell layers. The outermost, I'll make it black, is called the ectoderm the middle one which i'm not going to draw right now is a mesoderm and the innermost which i'll make a circle here is the endoderm now during development you you act, make a uh, condensation of cells here from the mesoderm called the notochord and the notochord causes a pulling of the ectoderm and it ends up leading, giving you a fold, and eventually that ectoderm ends up inside the mesoderm area, and that's going to become your neural tube. As it's a tube, you have a cavity inside, and you will see you have two areas. You have the area of the head and the caudal area. So the head area can sometimes be called the cranial end. Caudal end will be below it. So this is what's going to end up being superior. This is going to be your brain. This is your spinal cord. Now, I mentioned the cranial end is a part in the head. The caudal end is at the end. 
And the other thing that does happen is when you do bring the neural tube in, you have cells that come to the sides called neural crest cells. And they're going to develop here and eventually they're going to produce, form certain aspects of the peripheral nervous system. Now there are different things that happen. One of the first things that happens is you do have the development of, of the cranial end and the caudal end and then you end up by week four having three relatively distinct regions. Now remember this isn't a purely mammalian brain at this time. I will actually also want you guys to see certain things. For instance, cranial or head area is usually referred to as cephalon. So cephalic would be head. If you have something called encephala, encephala would be inside head. So if someone has encephalitis, they have inflammation of the inside of the head or the brain. Pro would be before, mes you've come across before, with, which is middle, and romb is rhombus in shape. So in, in week four, you have a big area of the brain called the proencephalon. You have the mesencephalon underneath that. And then you have a rhomboid shaped area called the rhombencephalon. And this will actually continue overall. Spinal cord will actually be coming down here. Now, by week five, the proencephalon develops into two things. One of them is called the telencephalon, which will actually end up forming most of your higher brain. And then you have the thioencephalon, which is actually inside here. And it makes up, it's made up of something called the thalamus and the hypothalamus. It is inside the brain. Underneath it, you do have the midbrain, the mesencephalon, which will be coming here this way here. Uh, don't worry, I will show you better pictures. And the rhombencephalon splits into the metencephalon and the myelencephalon. Milo means marrow or uh, uh, spinal cord, which you'll actually see it in a little bit. So what becomes what? The telencephalon will become the cerebrum, like I mentioned. The Diencephalon will become the thalamus and hypothalamus. Mesencephalon is the midbrain. Metaencephalon will become the cerebellum. Myelencephalon will actually become the medulla oblongata and pons, which I'll show you in a little bit. But before I do, I want to show you there are certain things that do protect the brain. Now, the brain is encased in the skull. The vertebrates are actually encased in the, uh, the spinal cord is encased in the vertebrae. And you have three layers here. The, outer, the outermost area, the one that's closest to the skull, is a thick layer just under here called the dura. Dura means hard, so dura matter means hard. Underneath it, you have an area which has a lot of connections between it going all over the place. And it kind of looks like a spider web to people. And so they called it the arachnoid layer. And underneath that, touching the brain, is the pia mater. The pia mater is a one cell layer thick, and it really keeps things from, things from actually coming and touching the brain. And so you have three layers of the meninges. The meninges is a pad that protects the brain. And I use pad because you can see it has an acronym. So you have the pia for then you have the arachnoid, and then you have the dura, and then you have the skull. So you have the brain, pia, arachnoid, dura, and the blood vessels are really between the arachnoid and pia in a place called the subarachnoid space. Uh, you can see some of it here. You do have some sinuses here, which are just pretty much big veins in this case. And the dura is touching the skull. And inside this area, you do have cerebral spinal fluid, which actually pretty much encases a brain and spinal cord to keep it from wiggling around. Now, it does keep the brain from getting direct trauma in uh, rapid accelerations or decelerations. But the other thing I actually would like you to see in this picture is you'll notice the outer layer here called the cortex tends to be darker than the inner layer here called the medulla. The medulla tends to be the myelinated tracts and they're going to go from the cerebrum to the thalamus midbrain, pons, and so on, going down the spinal cord. The outside layer will be mainly the dendrites and cell bodies, and so 
they tend to be less white or gray and tend to be gray and so you have gray matter on the cortex of the brain white matter inside I love this picture I don't know where it's at I've had it for a while but uh, I just wanted to show you something because it shows you where different parts of the brain and the way the brain develops it it usually develops from the medulla oblongata and works its way upward now I want you to pay attention to what medulla oblongata means medulla means middle Oblongata means oblong. The reason it's a middle is it's actually be the connection between the higher, the areas of the brain and the spinal cord. This is a middle. So the spinal cord is below, the higher brain is above. So it's a medulla, the middle. And it's a major relay between the uh, spinal cord and the rest of the brain. It actually is also involved in basic life functions. So it, for instance, it can actually regulate breathing, but it keeps you at a pretty much a volume where you're just breathing in and out as if you were in a comatose state or breathing or sleeping it is involved in a lot of the, th the basic life functions now if you want to change the life functions you have to actually use the pons which is up here pons is kind of a rounded structure here and it actually regulates the medulla oblongata and there are tracks going both up and down between these two, which I'll talk about later. Behind the pons, we see the cerebellum. Can you take care of that? The cerebellum. The cerebellum is actually involved in coordinating movement uh, and also involved in balance. And so tracks from the higher brain do come in here, tracks from the lower brain come to actually help you regulate everything. The midbrain is this area here. And it's the major relay between these areas of the brain, the lower brain, and the thalamus and uh, cerebrum, which we'll talk about later. Now, I am going to draw a little here because I wasn't able to find a picture I really enjoyed, I liked, of the uh, thalamus. But attached here, inside the cerebrum, you have the thalamus here, which I drew in red. Thalamus actually has a little connection piece because it has a cavity with, within it, which in, it's called the fourth, uh, the uh, third ventricle, and that connection piece is called the inner thalamic adhesion. Under the thalamus, he, in this area here, you have an area called the hypothalamus, and the hypothalamus is attached to a gland called the pituitary gland here. And usually things from the Midbrain will go to the thalamus, and the thalamus determines where it goes next. And so you have the hypothalamus down here, pituitary, the thalamus, and the cerebrum, which is what I'm going to deal with a lot coming soon. But first I wanted to go to the brainstem. The brainstem is the mid midbrain, which you can see up on this area here. The pons, which you can see partially here. The cerebellum and the medulla oblongata come down here. Now, all of these will actually play together for basic functions. Now, there is actually a cut area here, which is actually kind of neat, called the corpus quadrigemina. It, corpus means body, quad means four, gemina means twin. So you have four lumps here, which makes up the corpus quadrigemina. And the two on top are the superior colliculi. The two on the bottom are the inferior colliculi. And you can see cranial nerves already coming off. I'll talk about those in a little. And then we go to the cerebrum. Now the cerebrum is the main portion of the brain. It actually is what we call the higher brain functions. And there's a couple things that are important to see. One of them is that we have these depressions within the brain. Any depression we have in the brain is called a sulcus. So all these little marks here, the ones that are in black here, 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 are actually called sulci. The bumps, the rounded projections here, 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 and here are called gyruses. And you do have some sulcus that are present everywhere. The first one that I, actually, I drew in here is called the central sulcus. You also have one which is, technically it should be right around here, which is the uh, preoccipital sulcus. Uh, Temporal occipital sulcus is back here. And over here you have a big slit 
or a fissure. And so we call it the lateral fissure or the um, fissure of Silvis. Now, the nice thing is you can now see how the brain is going to be divided up. And one of the things I tell people is know your bones. I'm actually coming over here because I'm going to show you something. The sulcus here is a central sulcus. And anterior to the central sulcus, this area here, I'll write it in, is anterior, A for anterior. And the area back here is P, posterior. And so the area here is anterior. The area behind this is posterior. This red thing I painted in red is called the uh, motor cortex. And you'll notice that it's in the in front of the central sulcus. So it is called the precentral gyrus. The procentral gyrus, I colored it in blue here. Now, we have different lobes, and it's important to know these. And the reason I actually wanted you to pay attention to that first is because if you think of your bones, this area of the skull here is covered by your frontal bone. And so this lobe would be your frontal bone, frontal lobe. Behind the central sulcus, you have another bone here, which is your parietal bone. So it's your parietal lobe. And as this is behind or after the central sulcus, it's a post-central gyrus. Behind that, you have a area here, which is behind the occipital bone. So it's your occipital lobe. And you can see a lobe here, which is where your temporal lobe would be temporal bone would be. And so that's your temporal lobe. Now, if we were to take the lateral sulcus here and pull it apart, we'd actually see another lobe in there called the insulate lobe. And one of the reasons, things I tell people is if you think of the insulate as being insulated, it's actually inside there. You do have a cingulate lobe, which I haven't found a really good picture of. Uh, I think I do have one that I can, I will show a little bit later. And these are actually all involved in higher brain function. So now you actually have the basic structure of the brain. And there is another thing I wanted to mention, and that is underneath the thalamus, you have something that looks, well, it looked like to someone like a seahorse. This would be, if we were to cut the brain, the temporal lobe is here, and this is looking down into the temporal lobe. So inferior to the thalamus, it's, you have the hippocampus. Hippocampus means seahorse. And so to someone, this looked like a seahorse. And it continues up. And there's actually an arch here called the fornix. And the fornix will end up going to mammillary bodies, which are actually seen in the front. I'll show you a picture of that later. You do have also have another little area up here called the amygdala. Actually, it's right here. The amygdala is here. And I just wanted to show you this. And I do want to mention about the... Uh, olfactory nerve. Now the olfactory nerve is the nerve that comes and gives you sensation of smell. There's pictures I'll show you a little bit. And it comes to an area called the anterior commissure of the brain. That will go to the amygdala, which would be somewhere around here. The temporal lobe here. And it actually does go to cingulate gyrus as well, which you can't see on this. And once it actually goes there, it goes to the uh, orbital frontal cortex, which is here, for interpretation. And so for smell, you have the temporal lobe, the limbic system technically, and the frontal uh, lobe here. So you notice you have motor, you, uh, you have sensory, body somatosensory, the op, the um, uh, Occipital is involved in sight, sound here, smell is actually going to come over here. And so I just wanted to actually come here and before you move on, I would actually tell you to take this picture and I did have it in a lab or a version of it and draw in the major divisions because when you have the major divisions here, you can see the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, temporal lobe, the medulla oblongata, which is here. I'm sorry, the medulla oblongata, which is here, midbrain here, the pons, and the cerebellum. And I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I know it was short. I will have all of them coming soon.